Well, we've certainly looked at an enormous diversity of hominins in this course. Lots of information about primates, geology, paleontology, individuals who were involved with that. And now it comes time to kind of try to draw it together, bring it together. Uh, what can we say as an overview about human origins? It's complex, yes. Uh, it covers some six million years of time. Uh, different people have different ideas of how all these things are connected. New discoveries sometimes prompt the significant major rethinking about previously held ideas. Sometimes we have to change our minds even if we subscribe to a particular idea for many years. It's a fascinating field. It's an engaging field. As I said at the very beginning, because it's about us. It's about you. It's about all humanity. And it's about who we are as a unique species on this planet. Now, with all the admiration I have for Thomas Henry Huxley and his man's place in nature, I think one of the single most widespread misconceptions about human evolution is that once you stand up, once you launch into a different evolutionary direction from the apes, it is a straight line to modern humans. Now that is not what Huxley wanted to convey with this illustration. He wanted to convey the similarities in the whole architecture of the, the bony parts of our bodies. But it has morphed into, in many ways, you pick up the comics page or you pick up a, a t-shirt where you have humans getting more and more upright and then down at the end they're all hunched over a computer and underneath it says something went wrong here. Or you have a march from ape to uh, somebody doing something special like golfing or fishing or whatever. And it really, I think you understand from, I hope, much of what we talked about, that it's really, as Darwin said, a branching situation. It's not a direct line from ape to angel, as someone entitled their book. It's not an inexorable march through time from ape to modern human. Uh, even Darwin knew that. Darwin, as early as 1837, in his notebooks, he kept notebooks, and those notebooks are, still exist, fortunately, Darwin suggested in that diagram on the left that there was a common ancestry, been a common theme in the course, and that really a family tree is branching. And he didn't in this tree sort of give it direction, he didn't give it time, it didn't imply levels of relationship, uh, but he knew that there were common ancestors, he knew that there was, dis that there were, there was change among descendants, and uh, that there were related species that came from a common ancestor. This was the only diagram in the lower right-hand corner. This rather sterile-looking diagram, I remember when I picked this book up when I was a young teenager, that was the only picture in the book. didn't really capture my attention like Huxley's book with skulls of apes and humans and so forth, but it did reflect commonality from common ancestors. It did reflect change over time. It did reflect descent with modification. And it also, very importantly, expressed not only survival. Some species that lasted right up to the present, but also one of the other aspects of evolutionary change, the grim reaper of extinction. That there were many species that never made it to today. Didn't mean they weren't successful, it meant that something along the way brought about their extinction. The dinosaurs we know about and the asteroid. Now, whoa, you're probably going, phew. Well, there's really no other way to do this. And most of these names are familiar to you. We haven't really talked about Platyops, which is an interesting, not very well understood species from Lake Turkana, which could be an ancestor to Rudolph Ensis, which is like the 1470 skull. Uh, we haven't really talked much about Australopithecus gari, which is a descendant and a dead end of the species Afarensis, Lucy species. 
But we've talked about all of these other species here. And it's very exciting to look at them and to figure out how they're related. Now, the way that this is broken down is that the blue are genus Homo, the green are uh, Australopithecus, um, robust Australopithecus, the sort of yellowish are other kinds of Australopithecus species, the red Ardipithecus, and of course the black two other species, Aurora uh, Tugenensis and Chadensis that we've talked about earlier. Now, in 1970, when I was a young graduate student and my first year in Africa, this is what we had. We had Homo sapiens, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, little Homo habilis, and Australopithecus. We had robusts and uh, Africanus in South Africa, and we had Boisei in East Africa, which are sometimes referred to as the robusts. Well, today, and this may have changed from the time that I have put this course together and the time you're seeing it, but we have over 20 species of humans, fossil humans. We're alone today, right? We're only Homo sapiens on the planet. There are a group of Homo in the green, and in this yellow here, you have other sorts of things like uh, Australopithecus africanus, Afarensis, Sidiba, something called Bar el Ghazali we didn't talk about from Chad, which is probably just a Afarensis, and Platyops again. And uh, down here in pre-Australopithecus, we have Ardipithecus rambidus, Cadaba, Auroran tugenensis, and uh, Sahelanthropus chadensis, and the robusts, as we call them, Robustus, Gari, Boisei, and Aethiopicus. Now, we want to know something about the relationships of these, don't we? And uh, what you see here uh, are, is an example of the relationships of these that we will return to in a little bit more detail shortly. Now, let's take sections of this very heavily branched tree. And there are probably a lot of species out there we haven't even recognized, but based on what we know. At the pre-Australopithecus, we have a number of potential ancestors. We have Tugenensis in uh, uh, Kenya, which walked upright based on the femurs. Chadensis, which may have walked upright based on the foramen magnum. We have Kadaba with that one toe bone. And we have Ramidus or Ardi, as it is sometimes called, which has pretty much of a skeleton. Uh, was it perhaps an ancestor to later things? We stressed early on that the time between Ardipithecus rambidus and Australopithecus was too short for all the transformations to happen. Australopithecus, or Australopiths, as they're sometimes called, underwent an adaptive radiation. We all remember what that is. I think in two different arenas, one Eastern Africa and one in South Africa, because we don't find common species, do we? Robustus is only in South Africa, Boise is only in East Africa, and so on. We do have, interestingly, some lineages. We have a lineage between Anamensis, right, the species found at Canapoi, as an ancestor to Afarensis. Uh, we published a very detailed paper on that. And out of Afarensis comes, perhaps, certainly, Aethiopicus, possibly Africanus, but Aethiopicus leading into Boisei, and perhaps, as we will see, also Homo. Now, the robust Australopiths, as we call them, the ones with the big teeth, the heavy jaws, the enormous muscles, the great food processors of our past, we have two hypotheses. One of them is that Boisei and Robustus are sister taxa, coming out of the same ancestor, which would be coming out of Aethiopicus. Uh, or they are separate lineages with separate ancestors. And it's, at the moment, very difficult to choose between the two. In East Africa, you would have Aethiopicus giving rise only to Boisei, and in South Africa, Africanus giving rise only to Robustus, and if Sidiba is a valid species, perhaps to that. We haven't talked about that here. Well, look at Homo. 
Uh, we have a strong feeling, and uh, I think more and more evidence, that Afarensis was an ancestor to Homo. We have early Homo at 2.8 million. We don't know which species it belongs to. We have Habilis. Most people think Rudolf Ensis is on a side branch. And that Habilis perhaps gave rise to Ergaster, the Turconoboy skeleton. And then to Homo antecessor, which may have given rise to Heidelbergensis, in Europe and Neanderthals, and Heidelbergensis in Africa to sapiens, with things like Erectus and those little hobbits, Floresiensis, as extinct species. And you're going to have to go back and kind of look at this probably two or three times, and I hope you will, and I hope it'll re, uh, re remind you of the various skulls and specimens we looked at. Well, often people say, you know, Evolution isn't really a science because you don't do experiments. Well, we don't do experiments in the lab, right? We don't set up accelerators or work with test tubes or so on, but we set up hypotheses. And if a theory is strong enough, you should be able to propose various versions of your data and set up a hypothesis and test that. And it will be tested normally by new observations of the natural world, in this case, new discoveries of old bones. So in 1978, when I first announced Australopithecus afarensis at this Nobel Symposium, I suggested that afarensis was a common ancestor to the ancestors, to a uh, common ancestor to Homo, us, and to Australopithecus. The problem was that they were separated by 1.2 million years. That's a long way to connect those two. But I felt that this was the best working hypothesis. So what happened? It got tested. It got tested in 1985 with the discovery of the black skull, right? Australopithecus aethiopicus, the one found at Lake Turkana by Alan Walker. And it was intermediate in its anatomy. Remember, it had a big crest, it had big teeth, it had huge muscle attachments, but it had a projecting face like Alpharensis. So that kind of strengthened that lineage, but no homo. So what was happening on that side? Well, we had to wait a little bit. In 1997, uh, in the middle Awash, a cranium was found known as Australopithecus gari. It had big crushing molars and premolars. It had a little crest on the back of the, of the skull, and it had a projecting face. It wasn't Aethiopicus. It was a different species and probably another descendant of Alpharensis, in my opinion. Well, then in 1994, we found at the site where Lucy was found, at Hadar, a complete upper jaw or maxilla. And that had the rounded shape to it. It's called Homo spa. We don't know. It looks like it's probably an ancestor, hopefully an ancestor to Homo habilis, but we're not absolutely certain what was going on there. So that added a little information to the Homo lineage. Well, then Kay Reed and her team at uh, the site of Lady found this lower jaw, a half a lower jaw, dated at 2.8 million years ago. And Afarensis disappears around three million because of changes of the environment and so on. And I think that really strengthens the relationship between Afarensis and Homo as we have a strong relationship between Afarensis, Aethiopicus, and Boisei. So this is our current understanding of that hypothesis I proposed in 1978, and the information as it's coming in is testing every time the veracity of that. Now here is my overall um, family tree. I see the Australopiths over here, particularly the Robusts. I am, have a big question mark if whether or not Rambidus or Artie was an ancestor. We don't know what to do with Auroran and Sahelanthropus, too far apart, too different anatomically and so on, no intermediate links. There may be this separate lineage over here I alluded to. We don't know who was ancestral to that. But what is interesting is, and I've drawn a nice red 
ellipse around Lucy species afarensis. That seems to occupy a pivotal place on the family tree at a critical time in environmental change in Africa. It is a working hypothesis, but it suggests then that there were at least three lineages that came out of Afarensis, uh, the robusts in East Africa, Australopithecus gari, if you want to include that in the robusts, as well as something like Habilis that perhaps evolved into Ergaster, which is like the Turconoboy, and then ultimately into modern humans. So please go back, take a look at this, and try to understand those evolutionary relationships. Here's a cladogram, right? No time involved, no evolutionary distance between species, but it shows some critical events in human origins that all occurred first, except for Neanderthals, in Africa. It is where we see canine reduction, where we see perhaps the loss of the canine P3 cutting, honing um, setup that we see in gorillas. It's where we see the first upright walkers in Africa. It is where we see enlarged cheek teeth that may be related to living in a more terrestrial environment and not in an arboreal environment. It's where in the robusts we see a dietary specialization. Boise eye seems to have specialized in grass. And then we see reduction of tooth size associated with the development and incorporation and use of tools for processing food outside of the mouth. And we see the beginnings of encephalization, of an increase in brain size as far back as about 1.8 million years ago. And then we see craniofacial specializations that we talked about in terms of Neanderthals, and that happened in Europe, not in Africa. So what this shows us, interestingly, is that the bulk of major, I don't want to say steps or stages, but the, the bulk of those adaptations that characterize us as very different creatures from all other primates happened first in Africa. So Africa seems to be the homeland, the crucible for human evolution, where humans first appeared, where they underwent these changes, and ultimately evolved into Homo sapiens. So I break this up into a pre-homo group, whether it's Aurorin or Chad Anthrop uh, Sahel Anthropus or whatever, uh, Artipithecus. So I break that up into that group and then into the Homo group, which includes everything from Habilis, Rudolfensis, Rectus, or Gaster, Heidelbergensis, and so on. So that might help you categorize these and understand them. So with this, we come to an end uh, to this course in human origins. It has covered an enormous amount of territory, enormous amount of time. It has enlightened, I hope, all of you as to our place in the natural world, the process by which we have become human. And as I close this course, I want you to think about our uniqueness, about human uniqueness, how special we really are, as Zobzhansky said, and to realize that we have not escaped the bonds of the natural world. We are still part of that natural world. Mother Earth, to pale, the pale blue dot that Carl Sagan called us, is pretty much alone out there in the universe. And what we do and what we embrace in terms of responsible stewardship for this planet will determine how long this species, Homo sapiens, will evolve into the future and continue to be the most extraordinary species we know of in the universe. Thanks so much for taking this course.